This week on the Death of the Reader Extended Cut, hear more about the broader cast of The Three Taps, more from Catherine Lumby on Angela Breddon, and more about the test that Mottram seems to have laid. This is Death of the Reader. You're listening to to a CR 107.3, and we are Flex and Herds. I'm Flex, he's Herds, and we are bringing you Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour. Today we'll be continuing our journey out into the British countryside with chapters 8 to 17 of The Three Tamps by Ronald A. Knox. I decided to split the book up like this so today we can focus on how the detective chases down a criminal. Uh, in our last talk, we had a passive detective, and this, he's active and out for blood. He and his crack team of experts are chasing down the scent, but the other residents of the town aren't helping at all. The detective's out for blood. So yes. It's a bit misleading, but yeah, he's, he's, he's out, out for, for blood that, He's out cigarettes. for that criminal. <laughs> uh, tell you who else is out for that criminal. Tell me. Angela, <gasps> the best character in this book. Objectively, she doesn't get enough screen time. Let's be real. <laughs> we, we spoke a bit about how amazing Angela was last week, both amongst ourselves and with the amazing Andrew Popel from Final Draft. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that these next few chapters really go to show just how amazing Angela is in this circumstance. She's an actual expert in social engineering, which I love. Uh, and I'm looking forward to having a little chat about her because she she may have sold my heart just a little bit. So it's stick, a shame she's married. <laughs> stick around for that. <laughs> but uh, these chapters is kind of the middle bit of the book, which is interesting in a, a novel like a murder mystery because most stories, the hero is trying to like defeat the villain. You've got Mr. Skull with his big death sword. But in a murder mystery, you're kind of trying to find the villain. You're trying to locate them and track them down. Uh, And they may or may not be trying to outwit you in the process, but we don't know their identity. We're trying to figure that out. So how can you support a murder mystery, support a story, you know, uh, without a a rising conflict? Or how can you manufacture one? That's kind of what we're looking at today. Yeah, I think that in a lot of conventional storytelling, we have, you know, the villain, the bad guy, because people want someone to root against. Or if you're a modern Netflix audience, you want someone to root for because Mm -hmm. that's that's what Netflix seems to be into these days. I'm okay with that. I'm entirely down for that. More sympathetic villains. Let's go. That's another discussion unto (laughs) itself. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I think that Knox's approach here in terms of creating drama without a villain is really interesting. Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of a case of rather than you know. Leyland versus Breden. It's mm, yeah. Leyland and Breden versus the problem. Yes, yes. They're both trying to solve the problem, but they both uh, have their vested interests in a certain outcome. So they are competing. They're in a sense, uh, not hero and villain, but certainly they are obstacles to each other in that they're trying to both lay out their theories, um, which is always exciting. And along the way, we meet all sorts of colorful, suspicious characters. (laughs) Extremely (laughs) suspicious characters. You know, part of of me was looking at these characters and going like, oh, no, are these the actual people responsible? Mm. But we have to remember that we're working with our our boy Knox here. Yeah. Well, this is kind of the interesting thing that uh, Knox, despite writing these rules of detective fiction, particularly the one that says, you know, you have to have introduced the criminal in the start of the story. Maybe there's some leeway there. We have had Simmons mentioned, I don't think by name, but certainly as Mottram next akin. We've, we've had that mentioned at least. Um, but having, you know, the Bishop and, and uh, Simmons and Eames, all these characters who might be construed as suspicious and certainly having motive uh, to commit murder, we are by law decreed. Uh, by Knox's law, told that this is an impossibility. If you're not caught up to date on your Knox rules, we'll have a little thing on the podcast for you where you can go and catch up on a lot of them. But the long and short of it is that by chapter seven, we reckon we should have had everyone who we needed in the story Mm. introduced. Yeah. The way that I kind of think of the early point in the story is when the, the murder scene has been laid out before us. We should have seen had some contact with the murderer or the criminal by this point. But yeah. yeah. Now, by us saying that, I guess probably a lot of people's first reaction would be to say every character introduced from this point on is a red herring. It's entirely possible. I would like to dispute that. Oh. I would like to say that every character introduced from this point onwards is a clue in human form. I see, I see. You think that all these characters have a part to play? Uh, I mean, of course, otherwise Knox wouldn't have introduced them. And That's fair. Th- that's assuming that everything is done with purpose, which I tend to give authors the benefit of the doubt in the yes. murder mystery genre. 
I think that's a point to me, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, that's what <laughs> I was saying last episode. So I think that's a point to me. Was I not agreeing with you? Anyway. Anyway. I think that certain characters like Eames and the Bishop, they they so clearly are so suspicious. Eames is so like off-putting in the way that he's delivered as a character. Mm. But everything that he says seems to point to something, yeah. particularly when he's talking about how uh, how excited Mottram was in the week before his death. Yeah, I think it's particularly interesting seeing the characterization of the bishop um, because Knox kind of says, I am expecting to see someone who's a bit of a mover and shaker in the political world or like a greasy moneymaker, but he's very respectable, which of course is in line with Knox's kind of, his, his own ties to the, the Catholic Church, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it was not lost on everyone that the show is named after Death of the Author with a, a, a little joke thrown in there. But mm. it's one of these interesting things when it comes to solving a murder mystery yeah. that more often than not, approaching it with the Death of the Author viewpoint doesn't get you as far. Yeah, there is definitely a, like a really big discussion to be had. And maybe we'll have like a really in-depth chat about it at some point where it is important to like approach all stories with the idea that if you take something from it that's positive not something the author intended, that's amazing. But if you're ignoring the author, what are you doing? What are you doing reading all, like Knox's stuff and not knowing his laws? What are you doing? Get out of here. Get out with that nonsense. Yeah, like for us to be reading Knox's stories without appreciating the rules and structures that he laid out for them, mm. you know, we're going in with a, a, hand, a hand tied behind our backs. Absolutely. That said, I'm sure that Knox has written these so that even if you're not familiar with his rules, you should be able to work them out. Oh, absolutely. But I think that- That's a trick of it. It's it's more that if you go in and you uh, assume that you can't trust everything you see, then mm. you've uh, then you've got a hand tied behind your yeah. back. Shall we talk about some of the clues that we've been we've been presented? Sure. What do you think is the most misleading thing you can present <laughs> me with today, Herds? Ah, uh, I mean, that's a loaded question, Flex. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wanted to talk about the whole cigarette situation. Sure. Uh, because it's definitely the the kind of the biggest example of how Breton and Leyland try to actively, you know, go after the crook. Uh, they're just chatting around the the mill, is it? The, the mill house. Let's, uh, uh, let's not forget it was Angela's idea. It's absolutely Angela's <laughs> idea. Yeah. But uh, they're chatting around the mill house and they, they hear, you know, the sound of someone running away and there's a cigarette left at the crime scene. And of course, we all know this is a clue as to the identity um, and it's the Calipoli brand, I believe. I think that's right. That sounds right to me. Isn't that also like an ice cream or something? Anyway, the Calypso. Point is, there's a cigarette there. And, I have uh, no clue. <laughs> <laughs> the expert team decide that they're going to use this cigarette to try and track down the killer. And so they uh, they ask Angela for help, of course. Of course. Our, because our brilliant social, social engineer. Us. Yeah. They're like, yo, Angela. How do we catch this person? We need to show them to like, we need to get them to show us the inside of their cigarette cases, Brinkman and Pultney, because these are the two smokers of the of the household. And she says, she says, well, don't you worry, leave everything to me. You guys can be in the conversation, but just don't say anything. And there's a really great moment where Brennan, they're, they're making some comment about how like high strung there are. And Brennan's like, you mean you, you, you feel like spicy, like, like tobacco or something? And she kicks him under the table. <laughs> Like, she just cannot hold herself still. It's great. Um, and, yeah, she socially engineers the situation to check out their silverware to see if there's a lion on it, and that's how they get a look inside the, the cigarette cases of our suspects. I think, as we were saying last week, Angela is a brilliant example of how to do Watson correctly, how to yeah. do the Watson-type character. And I think that scene is a really great example of why, because the detective can't really be the social engineer yeah. and, you know, and the detective at the same time. We can't be everything. Time. Then he'd just be boring. You wouldn't be a flawed character. Exactly. That's it, why it, we have this splitting of like, this person's good at social stuff. This person's good at the intellectual stuff. Although one could also argue that Angela is also smarter than him. But you know what? <laughs> Brennan, he's a pretty face. Well, I, I think that it's, it's not necessarily about the smarts for the Watson. It's more sure. about their their engagement with the social thing there's there's some le level of sociopathy with detectives mm. where they have to be able to remove themselves from the situation and say like i think this is what happened using these clues and not really worry about 
Yeah. Uh, not not really worry about what people's thoughts and feelings were about it. And yeah. often in particularly famous detective stories, mm-hmm. that's the clinch as the detective realizes like, oh God, I have to be a human in this moment. Yeah, for because sure. Because they were doing it for a good reason. Well, that's that's maybe something that should be considered, especially as, because the kind of the, the reveal um, that happened at this at the start of these set of chapters was that the money from uh, Mottram's euthanasia policy would go to the go, church. Go, go to the church, Ben? The bishop, yeah. You mean exactly what I said? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you're just you're just clutching at straws, my friend. Your theories are half-baked. Clutching at steel wrought straws that hold this society together. That's awful. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't seen no straws of that kind. I think you make it up, sir. But yeah, no, it's all going to go to the bishop after uh, it was changed to to um, take his son out of the will, which is all very sad for for Simmons, of course. But, yeah, uh, I think I think this is again another example of how well and tidily Knox did foreshadowing, mentioning yeah. the parish in the very like in the second chapter when mm. we're first going there, and the Bible, mentioning the Bible. Even though the chapter is obviously titled, you know, something about the bishop, we we still don't feel cheated in any way when they arrive eight chapters in because all of these clues have been laid out well in advance. We knew that we had to have a chat with the bishop at some point or someone related to the church because there's all these little hints leading us over there. There definitely is a very uh, defined elegance with the way that Knox lays out his puzzles in that Mm. manner. Um, you know, even as I was saying last week where I was so extraordinarily suspicious of Brinkman, there was, there was always this doubt in my mind that Mm. Brinkman was a murderer. Yeah. Um, and I think that the clues that were laid out in chapters eight to 17 really kind of fleshed out what those doubts were. They definitely portray him as being very suspicious. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say before we get to the third section. But uh, <laughs> he's definitely hiding something. And we'll definitely get to this when we're, we're discussing who we think the culprit is later in the show. But I do think that Brinkman is trying to assuade himself of the crime by assisting the, the detectives in their method of deduction right. rather than misleading them. Well, this is one of the interesting things coming back to, to Layla and Brett and their sort of relationship, how they they both want to, you know, say it's murder or suicide. And they'll both see the same piece of evidence and they'll spin it both ways. Yes. So when they find this, the single scrap of paper that's been held by fingers like into a fire, um, uh, Leyland said, well, obviously it's a murderer trying to hide the evidence. And then Breton says, well, obviously if they were actually trying to hide the evidence, they wouldn't have left that little scrap of paper there. In fact, I don't even think it was in the room until after we investigated the crime scene the first time. And so they'll like both characters, both competent individuals, both intelligent people. One is a detective, though, obviously. But they both find the exact same piece of evidence and they they spin it around. If you can think of this murder mystery like a well laid out chessboard, they're spinning it around. They're trying to think of it from the angle of, of the criminal or the lack of a criminal, which is the fun part, trying to figure out which way around the evidence goes. And if you spin it so many times, you're going to fall over. I, th- I think that that's... One of the fantastic things about just logic in general, and particularly perspective-based logic, yeah. is that you can you can just flip it as many times as you want. The whole angle of reverse psychology, you can just go, but it's reverse psychology, but it's reverse, reverse psychology. Yeah, you go, it's yeah. reverse, reverse, reverse yeah, psychology, totally. so on ad infinitum. And I think that the way that that scene plays out almost seems like a criticism of that trope, and I like <laughs> the way that it's presented both as a criticism without really taking you out of the moment. Yeah, no. I think that's one of the greatest strengths is that even though there is comedy and absurdism, some breaking of the fourth wall, um, the novel does a really good job of putting you in the shoes of the detective um, and like putting it like you, you feel like uh, you're in that conversation between Leland and Breda and you're discussing which way the evidence is going and at the end of it, because there is no like 100%, you know, realization, he hasn't pointed at the criminal and said, you are the criminal. You're the reader, like encouraged to make your own deduction. Yeah. One of Knox's decalogue is that uh, the detective must not light on any clues, which are not mm. instantly produced for the inspection of the reader. Yep. And I think that this scene is an example of how to do that rule well. well. Yep. It doesn't feel clunky. It feels very organic. Um, even the entirely scripted conversation between Leyland and Breton where they try to set up Brinkman. One thing that I really liked just for characterization's sake, where Leyland, who is a cop and he's done this a lot of times, he's tried to like set up, set people up through conversations like this. Um, and Breton, who obviously hasn't, but if you look at the dialogue, the way it flows, 
Breden's paragraphs are almost entirely him thinking to himself and then three or four word sentences and that's it. Whereas Leyland's are like these full paragraphs. So showing that characterization of how Leyland is obviously very used to uh, playing with criminals and trying to trick them into revealing themselves or, or help innocents to, you know, come forward with evidence, that sort of thing. And Breton isn't as used to that sort of thing. I really like the way that they characterize them in that scene. And of course, the way that we characterize that Angela is still the one that figures everything out. I anyway. mean, obviously, look, that was just, <laughs> that was just, that didn't need to be said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did speak a bit with Andrew Popel last week about mm. how good it is that Knox as a writer in the 1920s was putting forward these strong female characters yes, yep. with a, a strong identity, a strong mind, yep. strong characterization. And I, you know, I, I think that I, I still absolutely stand by this the further we get into the novel. Yep. Angela is a really good example. Um, the other female characters don't really do much, but that said, I don't feel like any of the characters outside of the main three, like crack team of experts really do much. The barmaid just says, right ho. And apparently that's her name. And Pulteney points out clues uh, and is not suspicious at all, obviously. Um, and Brinkman takes us for a walk to the gorge and doesn't say anything. Well, so, you know, <laughs> I, I think that that's kind of one of the difficulties with detective fiction in general is that, you know, un unless we take the Midsummer Murders approach where mm. thousands of people die in the same town in the space of a few weeks right. and we're solving every single one of those murders so we have some recurring characters, like, most detective novels, we get there, here's the cast of characters, yep. this one's the one responsible, let's move on to the next cast of characters we can solve. Yeah, sure. So so keeping our characterization with our detectives is, is mm. kind of a staple and the only real reliable way to, I think, have proper characterization in a novel as short as this. I'm really looking forward to, uh, if, if we go on and read any of the other Miles Breton mysteries, I think there are five of them, seeing if there is a character arc for him, you know, seeing how he changes. Because I feel like that's, a, it's not a part of all serialized, you know, novel series, but I feel like that might be interesting to see maybe how Knox changes his writing as he went forward. I, I will say that given my limited experience with Ronald Knox, aside from dealing with his rules for so long, yeah, uh, I, I think that I would have faith that he's the kind of author that would break that ground and have an arc for his detective, mm. because that's definitely a more modern addition to the, to the detective fiction genre and... Knox seems like the kind of guy that's pretty ahead of the curve in that way. I would agree. I would agree. I'm looking forward to it. Can't wait to be proved 100% wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Coming up next on the show, we have Professor Catherine Lumby from Macquarie University talking with us a bit about morality and why our story without a moral can have interesting implications. Stick around. on 2SCR, we're on 7.3, listening to Death of the Reader, and I am here with Catherine Lumpy, uh, Professor of Media at Macquarie University. Uh, Catherine, how are you today? Yeah, very good. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Uh, of course, we have our regulars, uh, Flex. Hey, hey. And Herds, myself. Yeah, we've been talking today about The Three Taps. It's a detective story without a moral, and we just want to talk a little bit about why morality is so important to stories and how it helps us engage with them, uh, particularly murder mysteries, but also in other genres like horror. It's one thing that we've spoken a, a bit about as we've progressed through this novel, the difficulty of having a crime story that's subtitle is A Story Without a Moral. Yeah. So, uh, Catherine, I guess I just want to ask you going into this, how familiar are you with crime fiction? Yeah, very familiar. Um, uh, the... What I like, well, it's a, it's a subgenre really of crime fiction. I like sort of um, serial killer fiction, mm. um, and and there's some interesting research done by Professor Sue Turnbull from the University of Wollongong mm. into in Australia into who reads that kind of fiction, and generally speaking, it's tertiary educated women. Um, and you, and you, I mean, there's an interesting question in that, which is why would you know well educated women um, who many of whom would identify as feminists want to read stories about women being <laughs> cut up, murdered, and raped. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, and part of her thesis is that um, very often those stories have a strong kind of narrative in which the killer gets caught. So there's a kind of catharsis, if you like. So in a way, it speaks to um, a kind of anger and fear that a lot of women live with about the fact that 
um, they're vulnerable in a in a very gendered society in which a small minority of men are violent towards women. Mm. Yeah, and this particular story, it advertised itself as a, being a story without a moral. Uh, obviously, you talked a little bit there about the, the catharsis of reading novels like that where bad things happen to, to good or innocent people uh, and then there's some comeuppance in the end. Uh, do you think that's relevant to uh, – you're particularly interested in true, true crime, correct? Yeah, well, what's interesting there is to me, just on the story without a moral, mm. is um, Charles Dodson, who's, um, who wrote under the, the pen name Lewis Carroll, had an ambiguous interest in young children, <laughs> mm. and um, I, I use that word intentionally um, because we don't really know. But what his interest was, in some ways, you could say it produced wonderful works of fiction. But he um, had an exchange of letters with young friends where he sent her a, a Victorian children's book, and he said, "This book is not by Lewis Carroll. It has a moral in it. Needless to say, mm. do not read it. Just put it on the shelf." And I always found that incredibly amusing because, in a sense, um, if you read, say, Lewis Carroll's books, one of the things about them was he was trying to write against the grain of didactic, moralistic Victorian literature for children. And I do think that there's something incredibly interesting and worthy about um, someone pursuing a project where they're they're trying to avoid telling the reader what they should feel or think. Mm. Do you think that's a, a reasonable kind of approach to try and create a novel without a without a moral or without a, a lesson in it? Well, it may be less satisfying in the short term to the reader, but I think in the long term it's far more interesting because that takes us out of the zone of morality and into the zone of ethical ambiguity, which we all exist in, mm. whether we like to think about it or not. And um, and I think that. When you talk to people who say work in the criminal justice system, you know, I mean, from the outside, we'd like to think things are black and white, that there are people with white hats and black hats. But in reality, most um, matters for the criminal court have zones of ambiguity in them. Yeah. Uh, and coming back to the idea of true crime, which you spoke about on a, a recent piece uh, on uh, to a CR, uh, do you think there's a, a moral equivalence between how we approach non-fiction uh, murder mystery or fictional cases? Yeah, look, I mean, I think that there's, there are parallels, actually, mm. most strikingly. Um, I think that, you know, we narrativize crime in the mainstream media, so true crime, things that happen. Mm. Um, and and there's a very long history of that. And in a tabloid sense, there's a long history of people voyeuristically consuming that material. And I don't think that any of us are immune to that. You know, it's a bit like we, we kind of half cover our eyes, but we sort of want to know and we sort of want to know the details. And there's a lot of there are good ethical criticisms of the way in which we consume stories of rape and murder, which are true stories. Um, and, and we are voyeurs in that sense. Um, yeah. And so I, I think that there are, that, that there's a, a real continuum between the true crime and the kind of the fictional um, work, for sure. Yeah, there's definitely, a, I think, a parallel between the way that we consume true crime stories and, and fictional uh, stories of the same nature, uh, and even horror stories. Uh, a lot of slasher uh, films are based in real life, situ in, you know, real life stories. Um, mm. I can't remember its name, but there's one in particular in the Australian outback about a bunch of teens getting lost in the woods. Of course, that's a lot of horror, you know, slasher films, mind you. <laughs> well, Wolf Creek's a great That's the one, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic, um, it's about backpackers. But mm. see, I mean, horror films are interesting. I love horror films. I mean, they're, a, again, a genre of, and they, and very often, if you look at the really best horror films, you look at films by Tobe Hooper or Wes Craven, for mm. instance, uh, George Romero, they actually have... Um, political allegories buried in them. Yeah. Um, and and I think that, you know, that, that, that in a way there, there is a, an allegorical dimension to, to those uh, films and, yeah. and, to, and to kind of crime. I think we read uh, morality and so forth into it. I think that's one of the fascinating things about murder mysteries in particular is the way that we as an audience approach that through the perspective of typically the detective who's the one trying to catch and stop further crimes. So regardless of the the premise of the story itself, we still have that strong direction of catch the bad guy, which is kind yeah. of not 
it's not as prevalent in other crime media like true crime and horror, that kind no. of moral direction of the detective. Yeah, that's right. And I, and I think that, you know, that's probably one of the big differences if you look at fictionalised crime narratives and you look at true crime narratives is that um, fictionalised crime narratives usually um, work on that kind of classic mythic structure where you've got to have a hero and, and, and you know, in a way they often work on a, on a distinct moral narrative. Whereas, and we look for that clarity in true crime stories, but actually, as I said, um, there are often ambiguities in those cases. Um, and, and, you know, and tabloid media tends to kind of iron those ambiguities out because, in a sense, the narrative structure that they're looking for is one in which people have this sense of we got the bad guy. Mm. Now, I'm not saying there aren't people who objectively do evil or bad things, but... Um, you know, that, that's what that kind of tabloid narrative about crime relies on. I think that uh, that's also something that you kind of see in terms of which, even in crime fiction, which stories are more popular, because typically for detective mysteries in particular, some of the most famous ones through history are the ones where the characters with the grey the gray reasoning for why they carried out the crime are portrayed most authentically. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I think coming back to what you were saying about this crime fiction narrative without a moral, that really appeals to me, actually, mm. because I think real life is much more like that. Yeah. Something that we kind of have a chat about, there is a, there's a character in this novel, uh, her name is Angela, and he, she's our favourite character. Um, yes. Yeah. So this novel was written in the 1920s, which is, you know, uh, a lot, uh, a long time before uh, sort of more progressive, you know, social movements have become to, to gain mm-hmm. like, a lot of traction. Uh, and it's exciting to see... Uh, such a powerful character. She's uh, she's the wife of the detective, uh, Breton, and uh, she's she's not classified as the detective of the novel, uh, but she mm-hmm. often helps uh, mm-hmm. helps the investigation mm-hmm. with her so. social engineering. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and so yeah, we just wanted to have a you know to ask you: Are there any other examples of that kind of character, or what do you think about oh, that? Now you put me on the spot here. That's <laughs> a really good question, though. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that that. That's probably a narrative device mm. um, which allows a woman to have some kind of voice and agency in an era where they they wouldn't typically, you know, be like that. I mean, if you look at Patricia Cornwall's novels, which I think were really good, at least the early and, and mid of novels were great. I think she kind of went a bit rogue in her writing in the last, you know, few novels she's written. But, I mean, I think a lot of that kind of writing was intentionally a corrective to the narrative, you know, I guess if you go to the, the cliched example, which is Sherlock Holmes, you know, you traditionally see women as victims and mm. men sort of riding in on their white horse and solving the problem. Um, but what's interesting, I think, to say about that is that that's mm. rare if you're talking about the 1920s. Yep. And yeah. so there's, there's clearly something a little bit subversive in including a woman in that narrative. I think it's particularly uh, surprising, you know, especially Ronald Knox, the author of this story, is a Catholic priest, and that's not normally the forward-thinking, subversive no. person mm. you'd you'd expect <laughs> to be writing these kind of things. Mm. Um, no, but, well, you know, I mean, there's a, there's a distinct left-wing social justice arm of the type of Catholic Church, so I don't think we should sell them too Oh, yeah, there. no, definitely not, not to paint everyone with the same brush, but <laughs> yeah. I think that it's definitely worth complimenting the way that he's written such an authentic, strong female character in a time where that wasn't as common. I think it's great. Yeah. yeah. I'm all for that. More she's definitely the standout character of the book. <laughs> Uh, regarding Angela, the one thing is that, you know, she's still obviously the wife of Breton. She's yeah. still, oh. you know, she's still the the second in command. And I think that the way that uh, Knox kind of tastefully pushes that, you know, Angela is the strong one in the relationship without it ever being completely in your face mm. is a very mm. effective portrayal of that without particularly challenging or confronting people. It just kind of makes it normal, which mm. I think is very nice. Yeah. Yeah. No, it sounds really interesting to me. Mm. And I think that that is just, it's very interesting given it's of its era. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, my wholehearted endorsement of that. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah, she is very much the supportive wife, but she is... She is wonderful. <laughs> Good. That's all the time we have with Catherine Lumby today. If you want to hear an extended chat with her, be sure to check it out on the podcast. And, of course, everything else that Catherine Lumby has helped us with on 2SER. She is an amazing, amazing contributor to the station. So thank you, Catherine. It's always a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. 
It's time to fight. You're on Death of the Reader on 2SER 107.3, and it's time for Herds and I to throw down. Throw some punches. We're pitching theories. Let's do it, Flex. I'm ready to throw some kicks right into your notebooks. So as we beat each other over the head <laughs> with our theories, I've only read up to chapter 17, so I'm I'm the one solving here, while Herds is yeah. the expert. He's read the lot. Yeah, I am. I'm the one who knows everything. He's the person who knows about two-thirds of everything. And we are going to uh, we're going to talk about why Pulteney is the true mastermind uh, of the it all. The true mastermind. The true mastermind. I, I, I have so much to tell you. You now, just don't even understand. Herds has titled this segment, Citizen's Arrest. Yeah, Citizen's Arrest. Now- no one is doing a citizen's arrest in this but part of the story. But they're going to. Oh, goodness. This is the thing. And All right. We'll get into All it. Right. We'll All get right. into it. We'll do you get... want to tell me Do you want to tell me who it is you suspect? It's obviously still Brinkman. No. You are wrong, sir. First of all, wrong. F- first of all, all right. If you were the detective, you would just get it wrong. And then Pulteney would get away and he'd yahoo it off into the woods and he'd fish all the fish he could ever eat. Okay, and, okay. And Brinkman would be put away for a crime he didn't commit, sir. Now, last week we already demonstrated that an 80-year-old man could not scale the outside of a two-story I'm building I reckon, with a fishing I pole. I my old man could do it. I'm just saying. This week, Pulteney has been cleared of nearly all suspicion. What? What makes you say that? I mean, Flex, he, come he, on. he goes outside, he finds a bunch of evidence, he's constantly helping the detectives. You see, that's just what he'd like you to think. You know what? That was definitely on my mind as I read through <laughs> this, right? There were definitely moments where I'm thinking to myself, well, it's a bit far-fetched that Pulteney even found these clues. It's true. But at the same time, I think it is much easier to assume the incompetence of Brinkman as he fails to cover his tracks. No. You see, here's the deal, and this is why it's a citizen's arrest. Okay. Brinkman, he's blacked out his license plate. Uh Uh-huh. He's put sandwiches in his car. He's got an unmarked map that doesn't show where he is or who he is, and he's got a fake license, all that stuff. You know why that is? Because he's afraid. Hold on. Are you suggesting that he is going to yes. stake out Pulteney's fishing spot and arrest him? Yes. And that's why he that's left exactly during what's the happening. funeral? He is afraid either that <laughs> or he is going to leave. Oh, he's going to go out of the woods. He's going to hide from Pulteney because Pulteney's out for blood. Oh. Pulteney's got his fishing hooks of murder death. It won't be taps this time. You can't kill people with taps twice. You got to get him with a fishing hook. I'd really and like to see that. how one could kill a man with a fishing hook. It wouldn't be pretty. I, I feel like there's not much <laughs> surface area on the body where you could do enough damage with a lone fishing hook. I reckon, look, I've been hooked by a, a fishing hook a couple of times. Yeah, and you're still alive. Parents. Barely. Come on. <laughs> Have you ever been hooked with a fishing hook? It gets caught in your cheek and you're like, dad, wait, don't. And then he goes. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And it ripped right out of your face. Blood. There wasn't blood everywhere. Oh, it wasn't God. pleasant. Fishing's dangerous, kids. Well, <laughs> now, now the thing is that we're getting with Brinkman is that Brinkman is becoming so increasingly suspicious the further we get into the novel mm. that I don't think it would be possible for you to dissuade me from the fact that he is responsible. Except if he's a red herring, which I think he is. However. However. Hurts. However. I think I'm ready to concede that he's not the murderer. Aha! I win. I think... I think I was absolutely dead right, pun intended, Mm -hmm. at the end of our last episode when I said that Brinkman probably rocked up and accidentally killed the man and is now panicking, trying trying to defend his honor, trying to defend his rightness in the eyes of the law. Now, it's a bit of a strange thing to say, right, that a man has has killed someone and thus... He is, he's, he's not the murderer. Mm. But I think that that's why so many of Brinkman's actions are being so easily uncovered. Look, I'm just saying. A little trip to the gorge, you know. If he was the person listening in on Breton and Leyland, why wouldn't he say anything? If he is innocent, if he's accidentally killed a man, surely. You should come to the lawman and say, hey, I accidentally killed a man. I, Help I, me out. He, here's what I think. I think that you are you you are playing directly into Knox's hands with that theory. What do you mean? Why would I do that? Because that seems like I I guess the obvious thing to do, right? Is if you're innocent, go present yourself to the police and say, "Here's what happened. I think I I think that I'm still, you know, in, in the right here." Mm. But what I think Brinkman is doing 
is he's realized that if he goes and presents himself to the police, he will then basically be put through a court case of responsibility mm. over the death of Mottram. Mm. But by trying to get the detectives to naturally light upon the clues, he will hopefully basically give them all of the evidence he would want to present in a court case mm. before it even gets to court. So he has the detectives on his side rather than working against okay, him as okay. the police typically would be in that case. I, I see how you're feeling. I see, I see you. And I say, why or how would you accidentally kill someone? Is it like you get the knife halfway in and you're like, oops, I didn't mean it. And you just like take it back out. You're like, nah. Well, let's let's go back to Mottram himself. Uh-huh. Mottram has clearly made it seem like he committed suicide, mm. right? He left clues he was excited the week before he came to the place, un- unusually so, according to Eames. He left his name in the guest book before checking out. All of these clues that have really been laid down for us, right? Mm. I think Mottram has gone to stage his own death. The gas taps were going to be used as the murder of his fake suicide, but they screwed it up and he actually died. I'd, I'd probably be on the same side with you on that, that there's some kind of sitch up going on. I think that the stitch up is pretty blatant. Mm. That the the idea that Mottram was doing something himself leading into this is undeniable. Mm. I think at this point, but the the nature of that plan is still kind of a bit shrouded. And I reckon that Brinkman, as the one with the I guess you could say keys to the kingdom of the load of mischief, would be the one most able to make that plan happen. Mm. To make it seem like a closed room because he's the secretary and actually has the keys to the whole building. Mm. because he's the one that would be able to give approval to knock the door down, thus making which direction the door was locked from not matter and easily hidden. But isn't that just all too convenient, really? The man with the literal keys to the room that was supposedly locked being the murderer? I feel like that's a little too obvious. But I'm not saying he's the murderer. Oh. That's the thing, right? Is that I think that Brinkman was part of Mottram's plan. The plan went awry, and... Brinkman is trying to lay the clues out for the detective to prove his own innocence mm. while still his own responsibility. It seems like a dangerous game to be playing with a man of the law. It is definitely a dangerous game to play, but I think that the way that Brinkman carries himself, the way that Brinkman, especially in the first the first chapters we spoke about, was defending, you know, oh, it, was, it was obviously suicide. It was obviously suicide. Mm. And, you know, to bring notoriety to the town... And then now we get into this chapter and we have the bishop show up it, where dis- we discover that the money is probably going to go to the parish. Mm, yeah. I think that a secretary, a man who is good at dealing with money, mm. being roped into the plan by the man with a lot of money to throw around, mm. staging his own death, and then finding a way for that money to be you know, given out to that parish if the, the bishop proved himself to be of good character, which seems to be one of the interesting contentions around the bishop in this chapter. Right. I think that Mottram was going to stage his death, come back from the dead, and then give over his euthanasia policy money to the to the parish if they prove themselves. Mm. How would they prove themselves, do you think? I think by the way that they acted around his death. Like, if they came up and they were like, well, you know that money here that we're <laughs> looking for. You know, if they if they tried to push their own narrative to get a bunch of money rather than just doing the right thing, helping manage the funeral, helping support the people in need in the area. I, mm. I, I think that it was, a, it was a test of character for mm. the bishop, and that's why the bishop got introduced just after all of the actual clues for the murder itself were laid out. Personally, I like the idea that it was Pulteney, possibly motivated by Simmons out of revenge, you know, because Simmons doesn't like his old man either. I'm just saying, it's not motivated by money. I think that was probably also Simmons being brought in was also a demonstration of that test of character. Mm. You know, obviously we have someone in the family who you think would get the money from Mottram's will, but... Well, we know that he wants to to run away with his sweetheart um, off to, to America, probably, because that's where all the rich people go these days. And, and you know, that would make sense if he aligned himself with Pulteney, the American, yeah. in his plan to run off to I'm America saying, with his sweetheart. Pulteney does say that, you know... Those, those Brits wouldn't kill anyone, but an American would. I'm just saying. I, I think that we're definitely getting to the point in the story where you could still be right and I could still be right at the same time. If 
if the map to the unmarked location <laughs> was Poltney's fishing spot where he was going to smuggle Mottram out to for Brinkman to recover and bring back to the hotel in a show of glory, yeah. I would not be surprised one bit, sir. Dude, that's... Look, this show's called Death of the Reader. We're all about death of the author here, too. I'm just saying, we rewrite this novel. If that's what happens, if it turns out that Brinkman's, you know, the murder of the criminal, whatever, we rewrite it and we make him into the hero. And vice versa. That's how we do it. If if I'm right, and it turns out that Poltney is a savage murderer and Brinkman is trying to do good by his by his king and country, we flip it around. I, Same I'm, deal. I'm really scared that I'm going to continue playing the audiobook for next week that I've been listening to and I'm just going <laughs> to hear Herd's voice. voice. There's going to be a little crackle like on the radio. <laughs> And then it turned out that Poltony <laughs> came round the hurts. corner with his fishing hook in hand, but he lost his hand and he replaced it with a hook hand and he went, yeah, and he's just like a pirate. <laughs> and that's the end. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I think I think I'm definitely sticking with accident. All right, I'm sure. sticking with it was a plan between Brinkman and Mottram. For sure. I will I will keep Poltney out of the equation for now. Boo. But I will I will honor your contributions <gasps> to the genre and say that it is it is plausible that Poltney was involved in this scheme. But not sweet baby Edward. No, I don't think so. I think that the way that Mottram's character is presented, he would have explicitly left his family out of the equation. I'll be honest, I think you've been blighted by Angela. We're told. Angela says, you know, that's sweet Edward. It couldn't possibly be him. I think, look, as much as I love Angela, she blind. She blind. She doesn't even know. That's the worst thing you've said on this entire show. <laughs> I will not have this kind of disrespect thrown at Angela. <laughs> the best character, the smartest character. It's true. The best social engineer. She is a social engineer. That's what it says on a little plaque that she has on her desk. I'd believe it. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for tuning into Death of the Reader this week on 2SER. If you want to catch any more from us, be sure to check the podcast for some extended chats of oh. everything we spoke about. Yeah, it sounds like fun. You can catch us online on almost all of your favorite social media sites at Flex and Herds. Next week, we'll have Chrissy Neen on the show, who is in town for the Sydney Writers Festival to discuss her unique crime fiction take with The Wintering. All that and the final chapters of Ronald Knox's The Three Taps. See you then. <laughs>